All right. So Annie Sisson is a travel educator, consultant for indie travelers, and I'm sure she's going to explain what that means, and founder of Into the Bold, a community of travelers who love doing it their way. She's combined her experience as a teacher with her love of travel to help more people get out and see the world without big bus tours, cruise ships, or all-inclusive resorts. So over the years, she's discovered how to create a huge variety of experiences tailored to the interest, travel, style, time, and budget of individual travelers. So when she's not teaching travel, planning trips, or traveling herself, you can find her tracking down tasty treats or wandering through an enchanted forest somewhere. Same, same, Annie. Um, so yeah, you can find her at Into the Bold everywhere. And like I said, I am going to be dropping all of her links in the chat. And I'm sure she's going to be um, telling how to connect with her too. So yeah, I think that's about it. Without further ado, Annie, please take it away. Uh, thank you. I love seeing all of these faces. I see some familiar ones and some new faces. So it's so great to be here. Sam, thank you. Uh, I am so lucky I've gotten to hang out with Sam in person twice this year. So I was really excited when I uh, found out she was hosting. And first, thank you to all of you for taking the time to be here. I know we all have lives and things going on. So I really appreciate your time. And to the Nomadic Network, I love this community so much and thank you for the opportunity to show up and share all of the things that I love uh, and nerd out on travel with all of you. So I am gonna share my screen and I would love to hear, like drop in the chat, tell me, I mean, do you already plan your own trips? Are you comfortable? How, like on a scale of one to five, like how comfortable are you already planning your own international uh, adventures? Let's see, let me get to that. All right. Can we see this? All right, we got some pros online and we got some who are just getting started. I love this. Okay. Well, hopefully there is something for everyone. Uh, frustrated trying to find it off the beaten path. I got you. Um, hopefully there is something for everyone and we're gonna have a great time with this. As always, my brain is full of things and I have a ton of information to share. So I am gonna like uh, get as much of this as possible. If you have questions along the way, like Sam said, just drop them in the chat and we're gonna have some time for Q&A at the end. So let's get to it. Okay, so first things first, when you leave today, these are the things we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna talk about how to figure out what you really want from your next trip and the trip after that and whatever, because every trip is a little bit different. So it's important for us to figure out what exactly we're looking for, right? We're gonna talk about the different elements of an international trip and what affects the prices so that you can figure out what is the best option for you based on your time, budget, the experience you wanna have. Uh, we're also gonna talk about deciding what's most important and where you can be flexible, things like that. We're gonna talk about ways to customize the different elements of your international trip and then of course, we are all about saving time and money around here. So we are gonna talk about that as well. Uh, first, a little bit about me. So uh, my name is Annie Sisson. Into the Bold is uh, my brand, my business. And it's really about being bold enough to go and do things your way, right? So I am a travel educator. I love teaching people how to travel. Like I would rather teach you how to do it than do it for you. Uh, but I do also do consulting, you know, I am never gonna take over your trip. I'm not gonna book anything, uh, but I love working with people and helping them create the experience that they want. Uh, home is Salt Lake City or now, my parents just moved here to Olympia, Washington. Uh, and so now I get to play here lots. Uh, so that is exciting for me. I love the gray skies and forest and all of those things. Um, I am a former teacher, I taught junior high school for three whole years. And I always say, if I could teach 12 year olds how to use Excel, I can teach you how to travel, I promise. Um, and I'm a recovering corporate warrior. I burned my corporate career down about 10 years ago and have been finding my way through life doing all sorts of different things. Um, I consider myself an expert in indie travel. I have been doing this now for 14 years, planning my own international trips and then for friends, family, clients, and all of that. We're gonna talk a little bit about what indie travel is in just a second. So that's what I do, teach people how to plan their own trips and I help them do it if they want a little support. And then writing, I have my own blog and I write 
uh, some freelance and I love sharing uh, my experiences and knowledge of travel through writing. So you can find me Instagram into the bold. And then if you want at the end of today, if you want a copy of the presentation and I've got some special offers for you at the end, you can subscribe. It's just into the bold.com backslash TNN event. So, and Sam will drop links uh, as we go through this. So let's get to it. So first let's talk about what is indie travel, okay? So I say, this is how we rebels and misfits get to see the world our way. Most of us don't want to do what everyone else is doing, right? We're not looking for that big bus tour. We want something unique and interesting. And so for me, indie travel is the ultimate freedom. You get to create every single piece of this the way that you want. It's travel that you plan by yourself without those big bus tours, cruises, all-inclusive resorts, you know, and it's also a mindset that travel is an experience, not a product to be consumed, right? We're, we're going out into the world to have experiences, not to consume. And so it's really about connecting with your destinations, the people who live there, getting a better understanding of the world around you. And one of the huge parts of that is being actively engaged in your travels. That's what I love about indie travel. Like, of course, you can show there are these tours, cruises, these kinds of things, you show up with your bag, everything's taken care of for you. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to actually engage the process, but I think that it enriches it so much when you are actively participating in moving yourself around and figuring out what you're gonna do, all of that. So, and then supporting local economies. This is, I feel like a really important piece of indie travel that when we go to these places, we are, I mean, of course we're making an impact and we want to make sure that we're giving back to the places that we visit. That if you take a, a tour that it's run by local people or that you choose an accommodation that's run by you know, locals versus you know, a chain, if, if at all possible. So that's a little bit about what indie travel is and how I define that. Um, and so now let's get into the rest of this. So this is just the parts, you know, these are the big pieces that you have to have for an international trip, right? Got to choose where you want to go. Flights usually, uh, unless you've got some other way to get there, usually flights, somewhere to stay, how you're going to get around, sightseeing and activities, and then food, which is one of the most important elements. <laughs> so those are the big pieces. We're going to just kind of go, we're going to talk about those today. If you've got those things in place, you're going to have an amazing experience. And every one of these is totally customizable to you and what you want, the time and money you've got. And so indie travel is really about maximizing the time and money that you have to spend while having the experience that you're really going to enjoy most. Okay, so let's talk about different ways to structure an itinerary. Uh, so there are a few, these are the three that, you know, when I'm working with clients or when I'm thinking about the next trip for myself, how do you want to do this? So as you're thinking about your next trip, we've got a few options. So you can do day trips. You can base yourself in one place and just stay there. That way you don't have to pack up and move around and figure out, you know, how to get around and all of those things. And then you can take day trips, whether you take them with a local tour or, you know, like hop on a train and go to somewhere so you can do day trips. Uh, the next one I call is a round trip where you're starting and ending in the same place but you, you know, venture out, spend more time out in the places around your starting point, but you're starting and ending in the same place and then you just, you know, make a loop. Uh, maybe it's a road trip, something like that. And then the last one is what I call an open draw where you're starting in one place, ending in another place. So you're gonna, you know, that's gonna affect your flights. You're gonna be flying into one and away from, you know, flying home from another destination and making your way from one to the next. And so, those are really the three types of itineraries that you have available when you're looking at your next trip. And now this is the important part. Before you can decide what kind of itinerary, these, this is all about designing your trip intentionally. So when every time I have a new trip to plan, these are the five questions I start with because every trip is different and I'll tell you more about that, my current situation. So first, what's the reason for the trip? Are you going for like a destination wedding? Are you going to you know, celebrate an anniversary? Are you going by yourself on, a, on your first solo trip? What is kind of the reason for this? Maybe you just have some vacation days you need to use up and like, that's, that's the whole point. Um, so this 
goes hand in hand with the second one. And what do you want to get from this? So the first one is like externally, why are we choo- why are we going on this trip? And the second is, what do you want to get from this trip? What are you hoping to find? Are you like on the edge of burnout and you need some just total rest and relaxation? Or are you just like stir crazy and you want to go adventuring and see a bunch of new places and have new experiences? Are you trying to build a skill? Are you like learning a language and you want to go immerse yourself and you want to come out of this, you know, having more fluency? So what is it that you are hoping for your own personal desire to get out of this trip? And once you are clear on kind of those two, what is it that you really want? How do you want to feel? And then think about how do you imagine spending your days? With that in mind, like, I want to feel like this. Let's just say I, I am currently in the space after having my parents move from one state to the other. I just, I want something super chill. I want to feel like I don't have to be on the move. I don't have to go, go, go. And so what does that look like when you close your eyes and envision what that kind of trip looks like? What do you see? Do you see, you know, walking through the forest, sitting by the beach, um, you know, sitting in cafes, walking through cobblestone streets? What do you envision? How, how is that that you want going to come to you? And then, of course, after that, once you have kind of a vision of how you want to spend your days, what types of environments would be best for that? Like, if I want rest and relaxation, a huge bustling city is probably not going to be my destination of choice, right? Like I might choose a smaller city with some things to explore, but that's not huge. Or I might choose to go to like a national park somewhere, whatever. But to think about what environments are most conducive to this experience you wanna have. And then number five, how quickly do you want to move? Like I tend to be more on the move. I like to be active. I like to you know see a lot of things. But right now, this next trip I'm looking at, I don't really want to move around a lot. I am tired. I have done a lot. <laughs> I've done a lot of that over the last month. So that's going to look really different than previous trips that I've planned. So these are the five questions to start with. This will give you a clear picture of what you want. And that way, you know what you're looking for. It saves you time on planning. And then you know how to bring it to life. You have a clear vision of what kind of experience you want to have. Make sense? All right. And then now it's all about customizing, right? You can, I mean, I could go on for a number of hours, I'm sure, uh, about the different ways you can customize these trips to you. Um, One of them is interests and hobbies. Like I have a couple of clients who are just on their way home uh, from Germany and they are huge soccer fans. And so that was like a central part of their experience that they went to a number of soccer games. You know, they did a lot of other things in there too, but like that was really a central focus for them. And like Kathy, I know I saw her on here. Uh, She has totally inspired me. She is... uh, a fiber artist, right? And so that becomes a central piece of a lot of her travels. And she really got me thinking about how did we incorporate our interests and hobbies into the ways that we travel? Um, And then the other parameters like time and budget. I always think of, especially when it comes to indie travel, that your time and your budget is like the box that the rest of your travel has to fit in. That And that there's so many different ways to do that. There's no right or wrong way. And then travel style, are you a slow traveler? Do you really like to take your time? Are you maybe like me, uh, a little bit busier? Like you wanna have more things to do, lots to explore. What are those interests? What kind of things are you drawn to? Like nature is always a huge element for me. Like even if I go to a city, I wanna find all the parks. I wanna find all the trees. Um, So just really understanding. And this link, if you get the presentation, this links to a blog post uh, that I wrote about, you know, your personal travel style. Um, but thinking about what, how to incorporate those things into your vision for your trip and deciding what's really important. Okay. So now you've got a clear idea about this trip that you want to take and establishing priorities. What are the absolute necessities to create this experience? Is it about a specific destination? Maybe it is that you've got this place you really wanted to see for a long time. Um, And so deciding what is an absolute must have, what are my non-negotiables? For me, like 
non-negotiable, I am eating at least one meal out every day. That is not negotiable. So I make sure that that is like, I budget for that and make sure, make sure that I leave the space in any plans that I make to do that. Um, and then make a list of like nice to have, right? These are my, I'm not doing it without this. And maybe those are sites. Like if I'm going to this place, I'm not leaving without seeing X. Okay. And then nice to have like, and it would also be nice if I got X, Y, and Z. Um, and then the rest you can be flexible with. So for me, I, I'm a nerd like this. Like I make it a game. Uh, can I get all of my non-negotiables and how many of my nice to haves within the budget, like within the budget that I've given myself, whether that's for accommodations or food or whatever. Um, and so that's a fun game. And I most of the time can pull it off. So, uh, but it's important to know what, what it really is that's most important. And then we can be flexible on the rest. Okay, so let's talk real quick about what affects the prices of these different pieces uh, that you need for an international trip. Now, this is not hard and fast rules. These are, you know, general rules of thumb. There's always exceptions. But so for destinations, obviously things that are going to drive up price, if you're going when everyone else is going, it's going to be more expensive. That's just how it is. Um, how popular a destination is. And then I couldn't figure out the right, a better word for this, but the societal things. Like there is like Scandinavia. If you go to Iceland, it is significantly more expensive than if you go to Thailand. And there is... A num there are a number of reasons that that's the case, um, but keeping those things in mind that how the society is structured, economics, all of those things affect the price of a destination. So for flights, the big things are usually comfort, convenience, and time. There's a reason first class is more expensive than economy, right? It's so much more comfortable and a much more enjoyable experience. Uh, convenience, there's a reason the 6 a.m. flight is cheaper because getting to the airport at 4 a.m. is not particularly convenient, right? I know, I've done it too, and it's not my favorite, but man, you can save a few hundred bucks depending on what's important to you. And time, you know, um, like the, a long layover, a lot of times a flight with a long layover has, you know, is a little bit cheaper. Like the first time I saw New York City, I had a 12 hour layover, but I got to go like explore the city, meet up with a couple of friends, and I got to, you know, have a whole new destination, you know, in the process. Um, like Oslo, I have done the same thing there. So it can work out. If you've got more time than money, that long layover can be like an extra bonus. Um, but deciding, it's all a sliding scale. So deciding like what, based on the time you have, the money you have, what's really important to you, where do you fall? And then making the best choice for you based on what things are really important. So uh, lodging, usually location, the amount of privacy and amenities. Like a great example, when my husband and I went to Amsterdam, we stayed quite a ways outside of the canals at a lovely little B&B. &B. Oh my God, it was one of my favorite accommodations with this um, beautiful woman who made us amazing breakfast. And it was less than we would have paid for a hostel dorm bed in the middle of Amsterdam. But this b, &B was like a three minute walk to the tram that took us right into the middle of everything. So thinking about location, do you need to be in the middle of everything or are you cool with just having public transportation or easy access? Um, privacy, it is insane the amount of money you can save by just sharing a bathroom, you know? And for some people that is like a hard pass, which is fine. Like you get, to, this is what I love is you get to decide if that is a no for you, fine. And that means you're gonna end up spending probably a little more money um, and that's okay. Cause you get to spend on the things that are important and not on the things that you don't care about. And same with amenities. If you want a concierge and a pool and a spa, like you're gonna pay more. Uh, transportation, very similar to flights, right? Time, convenience, comfort, travel time, early versus late, you know, First class train tickets are still a little more expensive than second class train tickets, uh, those kinds of things. Sightseeing, again, popularity. Um, season, when you if you go when everyone else is going, things are more expensive. And then the location, a lot of times, once you start getting out of a main urban center, uh, things get a little bit cheaper. Food, location, if you are right in the middle of the tourist area, A, it's going to be more expensive, and B, food, probably not so good. My rule is at least 
three to five blocks away from all of the tourist things. You know, um, when I see restaurants that don't have a menu outside for me to look at in English, then I know I have arrived in a, in a place that's probably a cheaper and better food. The time of day, like some of these, uh, I was just looking at restaurants in Lima. I had a trip to Peru planned, which I have changed. But one of the things I made lunch reservations because some of these like super high end restaurants still have lunch service and the food is just as good. It's just a little bit cheaper, portions are smaller. And then the formality, obviously, like a Michelin star restaurant is more expensive than street food. So um, depending on what, like for me, I will go to one of those Michelin star dinners and eat street food the rest of the time. But, you know, that's important to me. And so you get to choose on that sliding scale, what's important to you, focus on those things and you can be flexible on the rest. Okay, resources. So the best resources for finding, you know, the unique things that you want, um, hobby and interest groups. Obviously, if you have a hobby or an interest, um, there are plenty of online groups, which you may already be a part of, but asking their, like, if they have contacts in a place, do they know of, you know, groups that do this activity in real time, like that you can meet up with in a place, that's a great way to find and make new connections and find more unique experiences that you want. Tourism board websites, when I'm looking at a destination, that's usually where I start. Like this is the group of people who are responsible for bringing people into their city, into their region and, you can find so much more information as far as like off the beaten path kind of things that you know aren't necessarily in the guidebook. These websites are run by local people who know the local things to do there. Um, Atlas Obscura is always a favorite for finding off the beaten path stuff. Uh, I mean, seriously, if you've never looked at it, look at it, look at your hometown and you may even find some things that you didn't know were there. I totally did for Salt Lake. Like I have never, I have lived here most of my life and I have did not know about these things. And then Google Maps. I am a total nerd for Google Maps. Uh, I mean, you can even just zoom in a little bit and these little pins will pop up different museums or viewpoints or just, and I'll just click on them. If the picture looks good, I will bookmark it. And okay, let's see, I can check that out while I'm there. Uh, and those are things that you can do before you go. And then once you get there, nothing beats talking to the locals, right? Um, one of the first things I do, like my first full day in a new place is a walking tour. One of those, one of the free walking tours. Um, don't forget to tip your guide. Um, but the free walking tour, like I have had so many great experiences. The guides are so kind and helpful. And I have gotten, just by asking them, like, where should I go to lunch? that I have found amazing places. And I think there's an important distinction between where do you think I should go to lunch and where do you go to lunch? Um, and so, you know, a lot of times people will give information that they think, oh, tourists like this place. No, no, I wanna know where you eat. Um, but little things like that. And then the tourism information office, another great resource when you are there again run by local people they will have the like up to the minute stuff that maybe you don't find online like maybe there are concert a concert series in the park or there may be free events happening um or a festival that you know just isn't really well advertised if you're looking online but it's more tailored toward the local communities and that's a great way to find uh some fun and interesting things so those are i mean those are the big ones that I go to. Um, I think, whew, I think we have made it through most of this. Yes, okay. Um, I feel like that was a lot of information in, you know, I try to, try to pack it in. Um, and so if you've got questions, keep dropping them in there. And I would love to connect with you. So places you can find me, into the bold.com that's the website that's where you can find all of the writing and everything else that i have on offer instagram into the bold and seriously send me an email i love to hear from you i love to hear from my fellow travel enthusiasts what trips are you planning what are you excited about and it's just annie at into the bold.com uh, if you would like to get a copy of this presentation all of these links are live so that you know you'll get the pdf and all of the resources and everything have live links. 
So it's just into the bold.com slash TNN event. And then I have a special offer for you on Monday. Uh, I have a course that's kicking off that is all about how to plan more unique international trips, right? This was like the flyby high level, high level view of, you know, starting to plan your own itineraries. In this course, we are going to talk about ev literally everything from, you know, more about designing your trip, every single element of this, how to customize it, where to find it, how to search for it, what tools to use, what strategies, all of that. Um, and because I love this community, uh, I am giving you a 15% discount, which I feel like this course is already really affordable for what you're getting. So TNN 15, and then as a bonus for TNN members only, like it will only be us. If you uh, decide that this is something that is interesting to you and you decide to sign up, we're gonna have a bonus Q and A call with just me and you, TNN members only. So that is what is on offer for you. Uh, feel free into the bold.com slash TNN event, get your copy of this and then all the information in, will be in there for you um, about the course, if that sounds awesome. Okay, we did it. Questions, I wanna leave lots of time for questions. Uh, I love to hear your thoughts and what you're up to. Yeah, thank you so much, Annie. Um, really appreciate all the information, oh my gosh. And yeah, we definitely do have questions. Um, like just to start off, like what do you, normally start booking first like do you have a protocol for like i book the flight first or when you find a cheap deal or do you i mean that whole part about um you know deciding what you want a, a trip could stop me going personally in like so many directions because i don't feel like i think about that necessarily a lot of the time so how do you um what do you start booking first i guess or does it depend I usually start by looking at flights. Uh, I will usually book my flights before I book anything else. Um, yeah, that's, it's, it is really a process. And again, we go through all of this in the course, but it's a process of, okay, then once I've kind of answered those questions, then I'll brainstorm some destinations that like, these are the places I think will give me the kind of experience that I'm looking for. And then from there, I'll start looking at flights. And there is, for me, I'm all about, um, maybe it sounds a little woo, but intuitively. And when something comes together easily, I'm like, cool, that's, that's the thing. So like, if I'm looking at three different destinations that I feel like could really be uh, what I'm looking for, the one that's easiest for me to get to that things just kind of fall into place. That's usually what I'll do. But I always start with flights. Uh, Cause I feel like that's the biggest like upfront expenditure and you know, you have to build the rest of your itinerary around flights. So I usually start yeah. there. Cool. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, we got another one. Okay, so about your, um, you mentioned that you've done a few like long layovers. Um, so Janet has asked, can you elaborate on your long layover trips? Is that like built into your flight? Like, do you plan to have a long layover? Or is that just how it happens because it's cheaper? where you store your luggage for the day trip and like what's the immigration process. So sure. Yeah. Um, so long layovers, most of them, like I've done this in San Francisco, New York, Oslo, um, and most airports do have a place where you can store your luggage. I think it was, it's around $20 for me to store my carry on for the day. Uh, and then, you know, I, this is usually a place where there's decent public transportation into the city. Um, but like, for example, like Norway, because I'm traveling to Europe, there is there wasn't any sort of immigration. I did have to, you know, go back through security when I went to, um, you know, check in for my next flight. But that was fairly simple. You know, I was able to get my boarding, you know, I already had my boarding pass when I checked in originally. So I just had to pick up my bag and go directly through security. I didn't have to like recheck in or anything like that. I know. Um, my husband was looking at this, I think like going a lot of places, if you're on a long layover, you don't have to have a visa. Like they'll let you check out a place for, I think it's usually like 
up to 48 hours that you can be in the country and leave the airport without having a visa. But of course, you know, always check with the destination. I always look at the embassy website and their immigration to just see what if, is there any special requirements. But I build that into the trip. Like I was just, you know, the trip to Peru I was planning was going to have a like 15 hour layover in Atlanta. I happen to have one of my dear friends in Atlanta. So I was like, perfect. I will go spend the day with her and then go back and get on the plane for the next leg. So depending on, you know, how you look at it, there are different ways to do that. Oh, awesome. I want to ask you about like your trip that I know you had planned because I think people will find that really interesting how you shifted, but I also do want to, at least to have more questions. So I will save save that. Um, people keep dropping the questions. Thank you so much, guys, uh, for putting the question there so I can easily find them. Um, so we have a few more. So for a draw trip that is fly and drive, like how do you go about planning the drive portion um, for that? Okay. Um, a lot of times I will do a rental car because I love the freedom of a rental car, but not everyone is comfortable driving in a foreign country. So depending on where you're going, um, I have also done like last fall, I went through the Balkans. And so what I did was like, I started in Albania, I rented a car, dropped it back off in Tirana and then took a bus to my next stop. So then I took a bus to Montenegro. I rented a car there, explored Montenegro, dropped the car off and then took a bus to Dubrovnik and so on and so forth. So you can do it that way, or I've done, I've also done once um, we took, when my stepson and nephew were teenagers, we took them on a trip through Europe. And so we picked up our rental car in Paris, drove all through like Italy, Austria, Czech Republic, um, and dropped the car off in Berlin. So depend, there are a number of different ways to do it. You could also just take the train from point to point, depending on what you are comfortable with. So. You can rent a car that's usually, I mean, especially in Europe, that's pretty easy. There are other places in the world where that is less um, desirable. And so then you look at, you know, buses or trains from point to point. That makes sense. Um, we have another real quick question about your course. Um, does the course apply to long-term travel itineraries? It is about building itineraries of any length. It is all customizable to how much time you have. So it's really about deciding each element. And of course, if it's a longer term trip, you're just going to decide those elements for more places. So you can apply all of the information to whether it's a short trip or long term, totally up to you. That's what I love. That's what I love about indie travel, right? It's all about it's you. It's fully customizable. So. I know. That's the thing I love too. It's like you take the information and then you use it however you want. There's no one right way. It's really about learning how to customize every piece so that you can fit it to what you want. Yeah, it's really, it's kind of like just about like teaching you the tools so that you can do it yourself. I mean, that is what it is, right? Literally what it is. <laughs> Cool. We have so many questions about like booking flights. So I'm kind of just going to group a lot of them together. So um, someone had asked, is an open jaw flight always more costly? And also on flights, do you have any advice for how not to get overwhelmed by looking for like booking flights? That is a great question. Be my brain loves to like nerd. Um, there is a part of me that is a data analyst where I will like, you know, mark out all of the information, crunch the numbers, but I get it. So the easiest way to not get overwhelmed by flights is to really narrow down your destination. When you are searching for basically everywhere, like I'll go anywhere, I don't care. That can be really overwhelming. Um, so if you can kind of narrow in on a place or even a budget that like, okay, I've got $400 to spend on a flight, where can I go for that much? done. So having some clear parameters for budget, time, destination, the more you can be clear on what you want, the less overwhelming it will be. And like, there will be a number of ways, like, let's say I was recently looking at flights to Berlin. Um, like if I know the destination, there are still a number of ways I can get there and figure out how that works, but it helps to have some of the things pinpointed. 
Um, and then what was the other, I, what was the other part? Sorry, of I did group those together. That was probably a bad idea. I'm sorry. Um, no, someone, no, someone asked is open job flights, are they always like, more expensive? No, a lot of times I'll book one-way flights. I'll book a one-way flight to the place I'm starting and then a one-way flight back from where I'm going to fly home from. So some, because different airlines fly from different places. So like maybe I fly uh, like from Salt Lake, Delta is one of our major carriers. So like I might book a one-way flight to London on Delta, but then let's say I want to end in Berlin. Well, Delta is not the main carrier. So then I'm going to fly Lufthansa home. I mean, Tra you know, if you're looking for points in travel hacking, you know, there's a whole separate conversation there. But if you're looking for budget, one-way flights uh, a lot of times are the easiest for an open job versus trying to book the multi-city with one airline. That's so interesting. Um, and that's kind of like related to another question on flights um, someone had. Any, do you have any, like, what are your thoughts on like the, this crazy travel summer that has been happening, like if you, this year, like if we book a trip, can we expect that, um, I don't know, just like, what are your thoughts on what might happen? Like, can we travel by air with some confidence that we can arrive and depart with keeping our reservations? Like what about cancellations? Like, I guess what's been your experience? Cause I know you've been traveling this summer and I know a lot of people are kind of like still nervous and anxious about it. So what are your thoughts? Um, I always say the travel gods hook me up. Like I just don't have these kinds of issues that like even my husband. So my husband went to Portugal and Morocco this summer and I helped him, you know, I saved him a few hundred bucks on his flights. Um, and he, everything was, he had a couple delays but nothing got canceled, nothing got lost. Huge, don't check bags. Go carry on. Uh, that is a guaranteed way that your luggage does not get lost. Um, but I have really not had those experiences. And like his flights were a normal price that you would expect to pay to Europe in the summer. They were not these insane, like crazy prices. Um, but my advice is always travel outside of high season. If you want to go to Europe, don't go in the summer. Like go. Spring, fall are absolutely gorgeous. It's cheaper. There are fewer crowds. You're less likely to have issues. I'm a huge fan of, if you can, like next summer, I'm gonna be spending two months in Europe uh, on my niece's graduation trip in the height of you know, the busy season. And I'm starting to plan that now so that I get what I want and make sure that I can build in, you know, time and space for mishaps. Cause I mean, as much as the travel gods do hook me up, things happen. And so I think it's really, about just making sure you don't give yourself too tight of timelines um, and yeah, plan in advance. But if you can at all avoid going during the busy season, that's gonna help the most. Totally agree, totally agree. All right, everyone wants to know about flights now that we're talking about flights. Um, so we have and someone else is asking, what are your thoughts on booking flights through third party websites or using credit card travel points? And I know you mentioned points and that's, that's a whole nother topic. We're that's actually, have like two, topic. we have two TNN events actually coming up, um, about that. I will be hosting one next month and then, um, there'll be one later this month. So definitely, um, check those out. And before we sign off, I'm going to be, uh, just recapping a little bit more about TNN. Um, and the events that we have coming up. So yeah, if you're interested in travel points, which like I know you are Annie, I am literally all about the points. So there's so much to learn, but like, yeah, that could be a whole nother like two That's hour conversation. But yeah, um, I absolutely do not book flights through a third party website. I always book directly with the airline because if you book through a third party website and something goes wrong, they are not gonna help you. They're, you booked with these people, call them. So I always book flights directly with the airline. Like I've, I learned the hard way and my husband got to 100%. learn the hard way this summer where I was like, no, don't, mm -mm, no, no, don't do that. Um, so I always, always book mm -hmm. with the airline and yes, I am a fan of points and definitely go to those other TNN events because I'm not an expert. I am a travel hacker light. Like I have my one credit card, uh, and my one airline. I am not a super travel hacker, but I do love it because I've gotten probably 10 free flights this year just on the one I have. 
Amazing, amazing. I will also say we have a lot of resources on nomadicmat.com. Um, so like a lot of great resources on getting started with travel hacking and points and stuff. So that'll be a good place to start. I'll try to pull up and drop some links in the chat um, momentarily. Uh, so do you have, someone else has asked, do you have particular like websites you use for booking flights? That's a great question. Um, yes, and we're, I go into depth in all of this in the course, uh, but my go-tos, I always start my research with Skyscanner. Uh, that's my go-to. And I do, there's a great site called Flight Connections where you can see um, basically the routes from any particular place. And so like, if I'm looking like at Berlin, I can say Berlin, and then I can see where direct flights are um, so that that is very helpful. Those two, and then the one thing I love about Google Flights is that you can do continent to continent searches where you can't do that with Skyscanner. So those are the three mm -hmm. that I use most. And then of course, whatever airline I decide to book through. That's awesome. I did not know that. So I'm dropping off that in chat flight connections. Um, very cool. Okay, let me just get back to my question list because now everyone's like, Buzzing, like getting going, wanting all the info. I was having Annie here. We just have a few more minutes. Um, oh, this is this is another one that's a huge topic too. Uh, what are your thoughts on travel insurance? Uh, someone has asked. I've noticed a lot of travelers don't buy travel insurance. Uh, what are your thoughts and advice? Ooh, that's a tricky one. I. <laughs> Now that I'm 40, I tend to buy travel insurance much more than I did when I was in my, you know, late 20s, early 30s. I have traveled a lot without it. Um, I've also purchased it and never used it. Um, but the peace of mind is nice. I think that, I mean, there's a risk going without it and that can be rather costly. Travel insurance isn't that expensive. So, you know, um, the peace of mind is nice, but I, that is fully an individual decision. And this is another one. So I keep, I, I work as a content researcher and writer at Nomadic Map, actually. So that's why I know all of our content. We have a ton of stuff on travel insurance and I will also leave those links in the chat about why, um, after doing all this research, I personally am not going to travel without travel insurance again. And a member of our team, actually, she recently uh, wishes she had gotten it because she got her laptop stolen uh, while in a hostel. So you don't think you're going to need it until something happens and you wish you had it because it's really, like Annie said, it's like pretty inexpensive when it comes to like how much money you can save. Um, Someone mentioned just in the chat right now, you can get travel insurance built into most major travel cards, which is true to some extent. Um, it is kind of more limited coverage. I could go off on this, so I clearly won't uh, hijack Annie's presentation, but uh, it is another like very nuanced topic and a personal decision, like Annie said too. So it's, it is kind of about your comfort level and about like protecting you know, how much, like if something happens, do you want to be out thousands of dollars or do you want to spend, you know, whatever amount of money uh, that's much lower than that. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there, but yeah. <laughs> um, let me, let me get back to our questions. Just get a couple, chance for a couple of more. Um, some countries require evidence of arrival and departure flights, if, but if you're unsure of your onward destination, how do you keep your options open and get around this? Um, I've never had anybody ask for it, but that's probably because I always have flights booked and they can see it on my passport. Um, I actually don't have a great answer for that because I usually, because of the way my life is structured, I don't typically have just an open-ended flight. Uh, I like to know, you know, even if, I mean, unless you're going to be gone for, you know, months and months and months, you know, very long-term travel. Um, and even then I probably would have a flight home just because prices change, you know, you know, everything is in flux. And for me, like example, which we can talk about if we have time, I am fine to stay on for a little bit after if we want to continue. Like I just canceled the trip I was planning to Peru. I have 
all of that money in credit and I got the points that I used back. So like a lot of times cancellation, if you're going to fly with that airline again, you're not like, I'm not actually out any money. I'm going to use that money on Delta. Um, and so, you know, those are different options. And um, Kathy, actually, uh, I know she's doing a presentation in not too long, in, but I know that uh, she does that and maybe would have better advice than I have. I don't have a great answer because I always have a flight home when I land. Yeah, someone else mentioned in the chat, Iris mentions in the chat, you can book something on the same day to show and then cancel within 24 hours because of that. Yeah. Um, 24 hour cancellation policy. Yeah, that's a good. And also I used to travel nomadically for many years. I never had an issue with this either, honestly. And I never had onward flights a lot of the time. So um, I'm sure it can and does happen if you get like a really cranky border agent. But um, I haven't, I haven't personally experienced this too much either. So I would uh, not be as concerned maybe if that swatches any fears. Um, Iris, oh, Iris says she has been asked several times. Depends on the country. Very true, very true. Um, okay, uh, well, actually, um, you mentioned your Peru trip, and I think it would be really interesting, if you don't mind, like, sharing, like, what was your thought process behind, because you mentioned a couple times that you canceled it, and I kind of know, like, what, what your thought process was, but I think it would be, like, really interesting for people to, um, hear how you like pivot and shift depending on those travel goals that you have because that was something that was really interesting to me to hear how you think about how you travel um and yeah I do if you don't mind sharing kind of what, what your what happened yeah yeah so it was probably mid-august like I most of my summer has been spent helping my parents get it ready for this move so once things were settled like the house they found a house all of the all of the boxes were checked and we were like pretty certain like all of this is moving forward we have some timelines and i was like okay i need a trip um and what i did was i just started looking around i so i'm going to toronto first i have family in toronto i haven't seen them for more than a year now and so that was a priority for me like as i started thinking about this trip i really want to go see my family so toronto yes and so then I was like, after that, I don't really care. I just want to go somewhere. And so I used Skyscanner and was looking at where can I get to for cheap from Toronto. I was looking for like less than 300 bucks. Peru was one of the options. And I was like, no way, come on. So I dug into it. The, the option that Skyscanner had, I didn't love. So I looked, I decided to look with Delta and I was able to get a flight from Toronto to Lima, Peru for like $200. I was like, well, I know, I just saw Nancy's face. Yes, that's what I said too. I was like, I'm sorry, what? So I was, you book that, like I will figure out the rest, I'm booking that. Um, and then I found a flight, a lot of times I'll do a hopper, like LA is easy for me to get to from you know Salt Lake to and from. And so then I found another, it was like $250 to get from Lima to Los Angeles. And I was like, okay, done, I'm booking this. Knowing full well that I hadn't actually done this move with my parents yet. And that I may be totally exhausted by the time this is over and want to change direction. But when I see flight prices like that, I don't say no. So I booked them. And then, I mean, three weeks ago, I don't even know, this last few weeks has just been like three years long. Um, but as we started the moving process of like getting the last of the stuff ready at my parents' house, getting ready for the movers and, you know, getting everything packed up, hitting the road, all of that, I was just like spent. Like the idea, and the only thing I booked is I booked um, on purpose a refundable accommodation in Lima for when I arrived and two lunch reservations at two of the world's 50 best restaurants. That's all I had booked. And so as I'm looking at like, what do I want to do while I'm in Peru? And I just had this realization that like, figuring out an entirely new country, continent and culture sounds exhausting. And I'm already exhausted. Like I don't have the energy to do this trip to Peru the way that I always imagined going to Peru. So time out, let's, let's reevaluate. Um, 
And so like long story short, I have decided since I'm keeping the trip to Toronto, I'm staying with family, that's really easy. I haven't seen them, that's exciting. And so I, I definitely want some, some solo time. I wanna go see, I mean, I've never been to Toronto, so that's gonna be fun to explore, uh, but I want some solo time. And so I thought, like, can't I just take a train to Montreal and like spend a week and check that out? And then I can go back and it's around my birthday. So then I can go back and spend my birthday with my family and go home from there. Like that feels easy. And right now I need easy. I don't need a big elaborate, you know, multi-destination thing. And I want, when I go to Peru, it will still be there, but I want to be able to have the experience that I imagined, like walking the Inca Trail. I so do not have the energy for that right now. Like four days walking through the mountains sounds like a nightmare. And that's usually something that I love. Um, and so, yeah, I just canceled all my flights to Peru. I got my points back that I spent. And then I have credit with Delta for the rest of them, which I will now spend getting home from Toronto. And that's fine. Um, but knowing going in uh, that we can change our minds. And if you know that going in that I knew I had this situation coming up that was maybe going to change the way I was feeling about this trip. Uh, and so I booked with that in mind, knowing that like, if I cancel, I'm not actually, I'm not out any money at all. I've got credit to use on Delta. I've got my points back. Like it's fine. It's the same. And that I can plan the part to Montreal a little bit later. Like that's, that doesn't have to be intensive and, you know, require nearly the time and energy it would for me to figure out um, this experience that I want to have in Peru. So that is the nutshell version, but that's what happened. So now I will be spending some time in Montreal. I got to figure out, you know, where I'm going to stay and the dates, but like that feels so much easier. Yes, Nancy, I see you. I will. Um, that was, thanks for sharing that, Annie, because I think it's a really great reminder that even someone as an experienced independent traveler as you is still like, sometimes feels like you're going to be overwhelmed by a trip or you're not going to get um, what you want out of it, which I think is really important. I know a lot of people probably would just like, I mean, mine might just go along with it and, you know, not want to cancel because it feels like you're backing out or like something like that. But you're like honest with yourself. And I think we can all like definitely learn from that too, because you wouldn't get the experience you wanted and Peru will be there and you're going to have another amazing experience. that's going to be more aligned with like what you need right now. Um, totally. And I had all those thoughts too, that like, oh my gosh, I mean, I'm putting myself out there as an expert in this and that I'm an international traveler and I do all these you know, complicated sometimes things. And I'm like, I mean, oh, well, people, <laughs> I'll still have plenty to see and do and experience and write about with Montreal. And like, I'm, I get to do me, you know, I guess if I'm going to tell everybody else, they get to do them, that you get to do this however you want. I get to do the same thing. So there we go. Yes, absolutely. That is that is really what it's all about. Okay, uh, real quick, we had uh, this is kind of like a personal question. I just didn't have it. Um, I just think I know the answer, but she's like, "Do you work with flight attendants? Flights are mostly free for me. I'd be open to advice." And I assume that's a yes. You work with everyone. I work with yeah anyone who is really willing to do the work and spend the time and energy to create their own trip. If you want somebody to book it for you, you just want to show up with your bag and have everything taken care of. I am not your girl. But if, if you want to create an experience that you get to do on your own, yes. That like, cool, you get flights taken care of, awesome. And then we can talk about destinations and how to find, you know, the other things that you want. Awesome. Um, cool. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Andy. So if everyone wants to stick around real quick, I just I'm going to give a few like upcoming previews of what's coming up for uh, the Nomadic Network. Thank you so much, Andy. That was like, that was amazing. I dropped her links in the chat a bunch of times. Um, but Andy, reminder, where can they find you? Uh, IntoTheBold.com is the place. If you want to get the presentation, go to IntoTheBold.com backslash TNN event. And that will give you, you'll get the presentation and get more information about the offers, all of that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Yeah, so I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Can everyone see? I think you can all see. Um, let's see. So we got, thanks everyone for being here. We had, I think at some point, like 97 people, which is absolutely amazing. That's crazy. I just try to like envision a, a, a room filled with 97 people. Like that's a lot of people. So thank you everyone who came and learned and yeah, like make sure to follow Annie everywhere. So we have our upcoming events. Like I mentioned, like we do have one coming up. We have two coming up about travel hacking and one is just next in a couple of weeks. Yeah, in a couple of weeks, we got slow travel language learning, personal growth, travel hacking, travel souvenir show and tell. All of those sound fascinating. I personally collect earrings from my travel. So I'm always curious what other people collect. And then we have upcoming meetups. So go to the nomadic network.com slash events. And you can see all that we have chapters that are constantly being created all over and we have meetups going on. Everyone's just so excited to see each other. Um, we have our book club that's going to be coming up to so this one. Normally we choose a book and discuss it. This one's last month we had uh, Ralph Potts and he was great. And he's hopefully going to be doing a series next year. Um, but this upcoming book club is bring your own book so that we can all share our favorite travel reads, which I'm super excited about because I need more books to add to my list. <laughs> but um, so that'll be in a couple of weeks too. And um, yeah, that's that's about it. Thanks again um, for joining us, everyone. Let me just stop sharing really quickly and make sure everything is all good to go. Yeah. Thanks again for everyone. And uh, that's about it. Hope you guys all have an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again to Annie. Thanks you so much for being here. This was so much fun. Bye friends. <laughs>